Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, SmartCat, for inviting me to present today. My name is Talia Baruch. I um, have been in the industry for 25 years. I started as a trans, trans creator for literary content. So I trans created poetry and off-Broadway shows um, and then applied that skill set to, um, to marketing assets, uh, creative copy. So I do come into localization from content, very much from adapting content to, to international segments. Um, and then uh, did localization management, both on the LSP and the client side, uh, worked at Google in localization management for Maps in Earth, and then pivoted uh, about um, 13, 14 years ago, pivoted to uh, international products and growth. At LinkedIn, I headed that at LinkedIn and uh, ServerMonkey, um, always focusing on, again, the international segments and adapting integrating cultural, regional factors into the product experience and into a broader uh, international strategy. And so today, uh, and by the way, um, after this presentation, feel free to contact me. The best way to reach me is through LinkedIn and here's the QR code. Also, please join our uh, global community of uh, cross-functional leads driving international expansion at Global Sake, um, and you can join the LinkedIn group as well if you look for Global Sake. Um, and so today I'm going to focus my conversation on my approach to building a much broader international strategy, right? So a lot of companies have a localization team. Typically, a localization is seen as a language support production team buried somewhere within the org structure under QA or under eng engineering, uh, at best uh, within the product org. But um, my my vision with this is that we really need to localize localization, okay? We need to have a much broader, a much um, more cross-functional and much more strategic approach to localization and to view it not as a tail end, um, you know, production cycle, but rather as, as a front end uh, propeller for global growth, right? It's a very strategic effort. And so um, I will talk, I will provide more examples and, and break that down more, but really it's focusing on changing the narrative from a global standard, which many companies who see themselves as global companies uh, actually perform on a global standard instead of a global ready function. Um, and um, global standard and global ready are very, very different. In fact, they're the opposite, right? Global standard is much more uh, rigid and fixed. Our back end is um, sort of one size fits all. Um, it is easier to launch faster in English markets, but then when companies um, want to expand internationally, they cannot hit the ground running. Um, and so changing the narrative and changing the paradigm from global standard to global ready, from copy paste, uh, one size fits all, to adaptive, hitting the ground uh, running uh, in different um, local markets on a global scale, which also means changing the narrative from a more linear and functionally siloed to a circular, circular cycles, instant deploys. We want to render the right relevant local experiences by geolocation, by language interface, by multiple different um, international factors. All right, so let's get going. So before we start um, uh, working within the company, we, we, we need to you know, before sort of looking into the due diligence of how we operate, we need to um, think a little bit into the horizon, into the near future, the three, five year uh, track, and beyond that, uh, the five to 10 years, um, and understand where we're actually heading as a company. Different companies have different goals, right? So where do we want to be? Maybe today we're just a startup and we're launching in English only, in domestic market only, but where do we want to be in 10 years? What problem do we want to solve for? Who, it is, um, who are we actually optimizing for? How do we define and measure success? And then what does that look like, not just in our domestic market, but you know, anywhere we want to hit, we, we want to reach? And, um, and then work our strategy backward from there, from that, from there, right? So we, what we do want to achieve, sort of the end goal is to wherever we land, uh, we launch our our ship, we launch our, we, we, we ship our product. We want our product wherever it lands, not just to 
not just to land in the new land, but actually to anchor, to thrive, to scale. And we want that to happen in any market where we have an addressable segment, right? And that is a very difficult um, task, objective to achieve. So let's break that down a little bit. Um, so the world is multi, um, and therefore we'll do an, even a, 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 an adaptive multi-strategy. And I'm going to use the word adaptive a lot because really that is the core uh, for success. Um, you want to have an adaptive backend platform infrastructure. I'll talk about that later. You want to have an adaptive uh, culture in the in the company um, to enable horizontal alignment of international efforts because they do touch on every single uh, function in the company, not just in a specific code base, it's every code base, and not just every code base, but really every function. It applies to marketing and CS and ops and legal and uh, biz dev and so on. Um, and so an adaptive multi-strategy, you know, basically means that different markets have different regional environments, right? The ecosystem is different. They may have different gaps. Um, for example, um, you know, if you're targeting a mobile first country, US is not a mobile first country. But if you are, for example, when, when WhatsApp, um, WhatsApp is a, a company that's based here in Mountain View in Silicon Valley, but still their fastest growing new, uh, market is India, right? Is they, they had built, it is a mobile app and they therefore from the get go optimized for mobile first regions and then adapted to the value proposition of those mobile first regions. In a mobile first, you want to uh, make sure that you're um, optimizing for, you know, onboarding your new customers on the mobile app. Sometimes you want to build not just responsive um, um, mobile web, but also, of course, the, the native apps and sometimes um, a lightweight mobile site, right? You want to have the, sp the splash promo of download the app in, in, in step zero of your product uh, discoverability in the market. Um, how your product is going to be discovered is going to be very different in different markets. <clears throat> Some, um, you know, in Germany, for example, uh, they use Firefox as their browser. Um, that is not the common, the, the dominant browser in the U.S. Um, in the U.S., it's more IE and Chrome, <clears throat> which is the same also for many other parts of the world. Um, you know, Germany uh, consumers are much more focused on or much more sensitive to trust and transparency and data privacy. And Firefox enables private search, um, even the search, uh, in, uh, sorry, private browsing. Um, search engines are different in different markets. Um, not Google is not the dominant in every country, right? We have Yandex in Russia, we have Baidu, Baidu in, uh, in China. Um, the entry points, the APIs, from which your product is gonna, your, your new visitors are gonna come to your product. The publishing platforms, the social media, all of that ecosystem is quite different in different markets, right? So, and then on top of that, if you put the other layer of the cultural factors, uh, what do your local customers in, in a specific mar target market, uh, what is their expected behavior of your of your product? What takes, what, what would, um, incentivize them to take the action designed for the page, right? Um, their mindset, it's not just a language issue. It's not just about translating the interface, right? It's really understanding the customers within the cultural context of the regional environment. So how we incentivize people, you know, if we want to take a current example, uh, uh, not just in product, right? Um, many companies, many countries now have a surplus of the vaccine and they're trying to actually incentivize people to take the vaccine. Um, in the US, uh, Crispy Donuts has done has been running a campaign of, if you show your immunization card, you can get a free donut every single day. In Iowa, they've now introduced, uh, you get a free baseball ticket if you show that you've been vaccinated. In the, across Europe, a uh, free um, glass of wine or beer is, is, is prompted to you when you come in to take a shot in Tel Aviv, uh, you get ho fresh hummus with um, broiling cup of coffee and uh, the green pass that gets you access everywhere, uh, which is again the the the, the you know the top of mind um, uh, incentive to actually uh, lure people into taking the vaccine if they're not quite sure. 
in Romania, Dram Castle invites you, this is the home of uh, Dracula, invites you to um, take the shot and have a free visit um, getting stabbed in your arm. Um, and so how we approach, how we position, if you apply that to the product value, um, not necessarily your, your, pro, your value proposition needs to change, but most certainly repositioning the value proposition so that it resonates with your local audience, that is definitely something you need to please think about, consider thoroughly, and try to adapt. So I've seen, I, I, you know, today I'm, um, I teach and I'm also um, a, an independent consultant um, for international product as a service. And what I see, and this is mainly, this mainly applies to US-based companies uh, of all sizes, um, including the multinational corporates, I see a commonality. I see that oftentimes their approach, these are global companies, right? They have global presence. But again, we know that just boots on ground and global presence is just not enough. That gets you landing in, in, your, in, a, in a certain location, but it doesn't get you to adopt the market, to adopt the remainder headroom growth in an effective way, right? If you don't do additional steps beyond just translating or beyond just even localizing, beyond the language support. We need to do some extra things beyond the life support in order to, to again, fit, fit the value and um, optimize the, the, your, your presence there so you can be sustainable there for the long haul. Um, so often companies split sort of the launches into US versus international, right? And um, I've seen a lot of companies do, even the, the data dashboards uh, kind of lumped together international into one lump. Uh, KPIs would be, okay, these are our international KPIs, success metrics, right? But we know, of course, that international is not a country, right? And different markets, even within a region, right? Within Europe, you know, Germany is quite different from Italy. Within Asia, uh, Japan, Korea are quite different from Southeast Asia, right? And certainly China is its own other thing. So having a more local strategy, um, and an adaptive, an adaptive strategy, strategy that can really look into the market readiness, company readiness, lay of the land, um, you know, user research, and really understanding what, how do we fit into that, the competitive landscape there, right? To, to best position ourselves into adoption. We don't just want to land; we want to adopt the market. You know, uh, an interesting fact. Um, um, you know, there are a lot of. Products are initially launched into in US in English, um, and then later is translated. You know that that makes that means that typically international. So we always say that you know early adoption markets are English markets because typically English core markets get the the first launch of the product, um, and then you know later on the company is ready for international expansion. It starts localizing its assets, and so non English especially low English proficiency new markets are always going to be by default late adoption markets, right? Um, typically, they also not only get late, you know, um, older versions of the product because, again, usually companies, US-based companies, oftentimes they, um, they build the product, they fully flesh the product. It's fully baked. They've done all the prototyping and the user research and the value prop on that product concept proof for English uh, domestic market. And then they do code freeze, hand it off to the localization team for, for the localization, for the language support into the, their multiple languages. Um, and which means that always, you know, the version of the product is gonna be two to three versions behind, which also means that localization team is constantly in a band-aid catch up responsive mode versus in a reactive upfront strategic mode. To inform the product experience. So the problems we're trying to solve for is essentially mindset. We really need to have a shift in the mindset uh, to, to truly understand what it is, you know, to truly understand who it is that we're building our products for. And if it's a worldwide audience, um, we have to clearly define our target segments and our target markets, um, but understanding that they our target market, our target target customers in Germany or in Japan are going to be quite different from our target customers in the U.S. So that would inform the, st the strategy and would need us to have a much more strategic, um, adaptive strategy, right? For 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 global readiness. 
The second thing we're trying to solve for is company culture. Again, from international, from localization and from international strategy as a tail end uh, blocker bug bottleneck for international launches, which is typically what happens, right? Um, and at that point, um, when localization is not introduced at the beginning of the, of the product cycle, um, you know, Albert Einstein said uh, the best way to solve for a problem is to avoid it in the first place. If you are doing, if you're running localization in a circular mode and including it in the upfront uh, product cycles, you're able to eliminate blocker bugs uh, during the QA and therefore reducing multiple rounds of regression QA, right? And that's really what we want. And in the org structure, of course, uh, because driving international is an extremely cross-functional horizontal effort, we need to have an org structure that allows for that to happen, right? allows an international alignment of OKRs. So the way I like to think about new markets entry is instead of looking at it from English, even English, you know, some companies look at it from US versus international, others say, okay, English core markets, UK, Canada, Australia, right, versus non-English markets. I like to look at it from a different, a little bit of a different angle, um, early adoption, late adoption, okay? So early adoption markets, yes, most uh, oftentimes uh, there are those that they are English core markets, but sometimes, um, you know, a certain company, even if it's uh, based in the US, um, you know, it might have already several company uh, customers and several strategic partners in another non-English market. And so they had an early adoption in that market, right? So it, it really depends on the company, but basically that would dictate all the other parts of the business. So if it's an early adoption market, it means that they already habituated to the value proposition, to your solution. They have better, stronger value, um, uh, brand awareness. Uh, they have brand presence, right? Uh, they probably have some kind of an, a, a perception of your brand as well, right? So in that case, in a mature, those are more mature markets, we want to focus on existing customers and on downstream uh, brand perception loyalty within the competitive landscape and on you know, conversion to paid, retention, local ambassadors, right? So things like, uh, you know, in, in countries like Japan and Germany, um, local corporate validation is critical, social uh, customer testimonial is really important, uh, working more on brand trust, right? More on how do you establish that brand bond, right? And then also, of course, optimizing pricing, price plans, packaging, like in Japan, you know, you always want to have a very high end, um, very expensive, full, all bundles, every all fully bundled, um, all, be, all features included uh, package, uh, because that's what Japanese consumers expect. Is they, they're willing to pay extra, but they want to make sure that they have everything included and it's the top top. Uh, versus in Germany, uh, you know, they would want to see sort of a longer trial, um, free trial. Um, uh, in, in South America, they'll want to see, you know, installments or pay later, right? So how you bundle and how you package your pricing is, is different in different markets. Um, certainly the checkout to complete orders funnel is going to have to have a lot of geofit um, optimization, right? But I would focus more on that downstream versus in late adoption new markets. They're later in the game, less habituated to your, your brand. You want to really more focus on just, just being discovered. First of all, so optimizing for high intent attribution channels, which are SEO, SEM. So having an international SEO, international SEM strategy is important. Um, having, you know, for non-branded search because people still don't know your brand there. Um, and then really for optimizing the, the quality signups. So um, high, you know, high intent uh, acquisition. People who sign up, register, actually then take a core action. And, um, and then that feeds into the bottom of the funnel. But a lot of focus is at the top of the funnel. Local content is really important at this point, uh, blog posts and so on. So um, when I headed international product at ServerMonkey uh, in 2016, I uh, prioritized uh, UK and Germany for a new markets launched. Well, UK was um, a, 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 an early, 
early maturity uh, market, early adoption. Uh, so again, I was focusing more on conversion and uh, retention. Um, even though this was an English market, this is an English market, they basically consumed our US content, our US product experience, right? And so we did have to do a lot of local content and a lot of um, geo adaptations. For example, uh, SurveyMonkey um, you know, has different survey categories. So in uh, edu the education survey category had to be adapted from a more private sector, private universities, and the whole, you know, you know, higher education in the U.S. is very, very different from the from the U.K. So more focusing on public universities and the very different uh, flow there. So we had to create new templates for high, for higher ed, new templates for um, healthcare uh, surveys um, in the U.S. We have HIPAA and so on. Um, in the UK, it's uh, the NHS. We had to create new templates for the, the public sectors, the local uh, councils, which are, again, public sector is, is, is not a thing in the US. It's not a big thing. Uh, certainly not something that we needed to optimize for. And so local content origination and uh, really understanding, again, the lay of the land, even in another English market, uh, was necessary to uh, to um, optimize, to uh, accelerate the adoption in the market. And then we also did some efforts around, um, you know, uh, we launched uh, UK's Big Ask, you know, um, survey again to, to bring the awareness and to start establishing stronger brand perception and brand loyalty, um, which was very, a very, very um, native campaign and uh, was very successful. In Germany, on the other hand, uh, late adoption new market, uh, the focus was much more on top of funnel discoverability and a little bit on, of ed on education because uh, for ServerMonkey, you know, it's a self-serve SaaS uh, solution. Uh, consumers in Germany are not habituated to that concept. If they need um, a research survey, they would go to an agency. So rather than they would, you know, the 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 it is more uh, do it for me versus do it yourself. And so we had to do more uh, focus on education about um, the value proposition of this uh, service, this solution, and certainly on just being discovered, right? So uh, CCTLDs, um, country top level domain, the .de if for, for SEO, of course, a lot of SEO efforts for organic discoverability, uh, dynamic sitemap with reflang, canonical URLs, um, you know, just again, just to be discovered, uh, but then not just to be discovered, but to be discovered by high intent, um, cu new customers that have a high, pro high propensity to actually deploy a survey. And I will show you later some um, A-B test uh, experimentations that I ran. So again, like when we look at what problem we're solving for, who we're optimizing it for, and how do we define and measure success, Especially, really, those three questions are core questions we need to ask ourselves because those will actually dictate the priority initiatives we will um, we will optim we will prioritize for our organization, right? And then build that strategy and align align the execution efforts across the organization. Um, at LinkedIn, for example, you know, who it is we're optimizing for LinkedIn is, uh, you know, the, the mission is um, uh, providing economic uh, opportunities for every professional on the planet. So the addressable segment are students or grads and um, professionals, right? That looks very differently in different markets. Uh, Germany, uh, the, the demographic is older, so our addressable segment was more the 35 to 46 year olds. So that dictates Number two, who we optimizing for dictates number three, right? Because um, it di dictates the, the 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 what problem we're solving for as well. So that meant that we are actually optimizing for career leadership for this age group within the company. Um, in Southeast Asia, the age cohort is much younger. So our addressable segment was the um, uh, the seventeen to twenty six. So that dictated optimizing for. Um, Entry level or internship uh, job, right? So we built job seeker apps for the early um, new first job uh, seekers, right? 
So, so again, understanding who it is you're optimizing for is going to look a bit different. Some markets are going to be more prone for B2B. Uh, in Mexico uh, and in Germany as well, uh, SMBs is very he heavily dominant SMB uh, countries. Um, sometimes you you might want to focus more on um, you know on free users uh, versus on um, just to create more equity um, and more just more content and more user generated content and uh, more free usability so that there is value for your paid users to come along later, right? So all of these. Um, these are moving plates that need to be adapted uh, based on the market. When we think about when, when, when I position sort of global ready versus geofit, you know, for me, global ready is um, we, we want to as much as we can. I mean, our goal is to scale quickly as much as we can, right? But, but not on the expense of quality product experience and of offering the right value proposition. And so Global Ready is really um, as much as we can to have a universal, a universal product experience. Um, but, but it has to be, again, fully internationalized so that we can render the right experience when we need to. And we, we, we are on, we, we can hit the ground, you know, we don't have any sort of formats issues, right? Uh, everything, all the checks and balances are in place. It's fully internationalized. We don't, we're not going to have layout issues. We're not going to have concatenated strings or truncated, um, you know, longer words for for French and German uh, with tr with uh, truncated uh, experiences in QA. Um, so fully, fully internationalized um, and adaptive in terms of the back end so that we can dynamically deploy the right experience when we need to on the front end, but as much as we can sort of a, a more universal experience. Um, for, for me, like the most important, the things that can be universal are certainly the, the the brand value, the brand value proposition. How to massage the positioning will have to do some geofit um, massaging as needed, but the core value should be there. So we want to have a skeleton core universal value. We want to have a core um, universal culture for our company, right? Um, with an adaptive strategy. And then the geofit comes when we're ready to, uh, we've we already landed in the new market, we are already uh, fully internationalized and localized, but now we have to do some extra steps. Now we really have to optimize some core funnels, sometimes even build new, new features or new products for a specific market. We did that at LinkedIn, we built uh, uh, new products that are market specific for India, for, for China. I'll, I'll uh, show later when, if we have time. Um, Global ready on the platform infrastructure means that, again, we have that modularity, right? So part of that is also uh, also means that we have local libraries. We pre-create all the native local assets, uh, font uh, font types, typography, icons, glyphs, uh, images that are local by market, um, customer stories, testimonials, right? Local assets that sit in local libraries and like a draw we can pull on the front end the right draw as needed right we also want to have um, a dynamic mobile simulator a lot of issues with with qa especially for mobile apps is that we we see a lot of rounds of regression qa um, it's you know smaller screen size and so we need to adapt for uh, you know, for different layouts and for a lot of truncation, a lot, a lot of truncate, truncated text with text expansion, uh, horizontal or vertical for, for Thai and, and other um, uh, ideographic languages. And so by enabling a dynamic mobile simulator where the translators can translate in context, in layout, during the translation itself, right? And so that dr dramatically reduces our uh, regression uh, blocker bugs during QA. And that's, again, part of that front end effort. And of course, you know, cloud native AI, um, software centricity, all of those um, are, you know, making sure that we, we are on par with site speed and, and page deploys, uh, page loads um, on par with all our target markets as we perform in our US domestic, domestic market. 
On the culture, number two, the culture strategic um, uh, mindset, um, we want to make sure that we have definitely executive buy-in. Oftentimes, the executives say, yes, we, we are, you know, international is a priority, uh, OKR okay, for, for us. But on the, on the, uh, on the ground, in real world, uh, the company is not built for that alignment, right? Uh, because international team is sometimes siloed or the localization team doesn't have necessarily the access visibility to the corporate core objective, nor the influence on the um, partner cross-functional teams for execution. And so we need to have a different culture of creating much more sort of its internal evangelism for international. Something that I've done that, that I found very, very effective is um, creating um, a stirring task force committee in the company where key stakeholder leads, representative of different factions across the organization of the company are represented in this steering committee. They meet you know, once a month, once a week as needed, and specifically to align on international efforts. That creates a lot of visibility uh, to the, with the top level, and also for the international team to understand the core objectives. They're gonna have to be a lot of trade-offs, right? Cost benefit. That's what number one. Number two, I, um, Something that I've done that again was very very helpful is again you know that the, the product developers the designers they want to build the right experiences but they don't always know what those are <laughs> or even have the awareness that beyond speaking beyond having the product speak a different language how should their product behave beyond that right and so it's on us to 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 show that right to share that to provide that information. Um, and so by presenting, um, just bringing real users, real user stories, I would actually, I had featured, uh, once a week I would send an email internally, this is just internal communication, and each email would focus on a different real customer story, meet Yanda from Mumbai, this is her lifestyle, this is what she loves about LinkedIn, this is what she, she, she this is what we can do better for her, here's where, here, here's the challenge, like, you know, the relevancy algorithm doesn't work well, for her, for in that, in her market, right? Search doesn't work well in her market and so on. That is very compelling. As well as taking different product uh, or diff product and different functional leads with you to field trips or to study or uh, work abroad uh, in a different hub that you might have in a different country, just spending a week, two weeks um, in a different environment really hones down uh, what you're trying to explain in many presentations, right? I mean, it's better just for them to experience, to be simmered, immersed in that uh, new uh, new environment and, and meeting their customers uh, makes a huge, huge, huge difference than developing products for them in remote. And then finally, number three is um, a mindset, mindset shift in the org structure. Again, most companies are structured in vertical um, functions, <clears throat> but because international cuts across all these functions, we need to have, we need to be able to enable that, right? And I always um, advise to actually have an autonomous international team. Localization is part of that, but it's not enough. We, it, that, that the team, the head of that team actually has the bird's view of all the, multi, all, you know, of again, where are we heading? How do we connect all the dots? How do we um, uh, orchestrate all the moving parts of the company? Uh, how do we tie the international efforts that we want to drive to the corporate core objectives? There might not be alignment always, and the, the, there are going to be trade-offs, um, and some things we're going to have to let go because they might not have an, a significant impact to the business bottom line, right? And, and so um, we need to understand all of those things um, and then we're able to really align effectively the right and prioritize the right MVP, most viable product uh, initiatives for their organization. Um, a lot of times, like every single team would have some, like marketing team would have someone that also does the, the, the international campaigns. Right? But when, when I always found that when everyone owns a piece of international, no one does, right? You really need an owner. You need to, for every mission, you need a missionary. missionary. Uh, there needs to be a passionate owner that does, in my opinion, come from product because you do need to understand, you know, pr product roadmaps, uh, roadmaps and rollout and uh, um, 
uh, and just building the PRDs and understanding you know, trade-offs and, and launch cycles, and also be able to influence the other um, product partners. Um, and so you need to really have a broad, broad understanding of what's realistic, what's feasible, and, and amazing relationships to coordinate all that across the organization. And then when the company is more mature, um, you can also start having country PMs, product managers, right? So kind of trading a country as a product, if you like, right? So a Germany product manager, a Japan product manager. It's not necessary for every market, obviously, but some countries do require more efforts, more geofit adaptations. Um, and those countries really need uh, a champion to understand fully the market research, user research, continuous A-B testing, right? Um, and, uh, and optimize specifically for that target market. So now I'm going to share with you just a couple of A-B test experiments uh, just to kind of hone down what it was, the concepts I was talking about. So at StubbyMonkey, I was very fortunate to actually also own the, um, I sat with it, within the growth team, within the product team, and growth really internationally is a huge level for growth, and so that's a good home for, for international efforts. And I owned the um, A-B testing platform and all the logged out top of funnel code base, which allowed me a lot of freedom and flexibility to test in, to test specifically for international segments, which a lot of US-based companies do not do, right? They test a lot, uh, but only in English um, and mostly in domestic market. And so, um, as I mentioned before, at SurveyMonkey, um, I prioritized for Germany in 2016. And so, I ran a lot of tests for Europe in general, but with a lot of focus on Germany, and then also on on uh, on BB on uh, England. Um, what I'm showing you, of course, when you A/B test, each element needs to be tested separately, and then um, you know the winning elements move on to the next experiment. So what I'm showing you now is accumulation of all those elements, but. Um, not only did we reduce from you know four field form to two fields form to reduce friction um, instead of sign up free try it free it's less committing in a new market again uh, germany was a late adoption new market for us um, so we needed to establish more trust and knowing that consumers in germany are more and more, and more much more sensitive to trust transparency data privacy right really focusing on those signals giving them those signals so the ssl not just in the URL, but also in the actual CTA made a difference. The image made a difference in the US uh, images that are of a, you know, kind of an, um, the individual, um, they perform better or images of um, uh, compelling scenery perform really well. Um, in Germany, in South America, images of a team working together, not a single individual, worked much better. So all, all those different elements ha had a lot of impact, um, even just in the global footer, instead of having Norton trust seal, replacing that with the trusted shops trust seal. It took us a year to comply with all the regulations. Uh, it was a lot of effort but uh, on the product side. But uh, once we did, that trust seal um, also was sort of a, a seal of recognition of local vetting for German audiences. that This is a trusted site, and that meant a lot. But by far, this, the one element, the one treatment that had the highest impact to the business bottom line was introducing, and this is two years before GDPR, two years before. So we, did, we were not obligated to do any sort of data privacy thing, uh, treatments. But I tested something um, that I would never test in the US because it 100% would introduce friction in sign up. And I tested um, introducing two explicit uh, check boxes where the first one it's I mean both of them are uh, opt-in so the user needs to actually proactively uh, check that first checkbox in order to for the button to work otherwise the button didn't work right so it's really cannibalizing my, my metrics um, and with three unique links terms of use privacy policy privacy um, consents each um, each is a unique link taking them to a German clean page that tells them exactly how we're going to collect, use, and share their data. Okay, 
So we did not change anything in the back end. We did not change anything in, in how the company operated for Germany because that would have been very costly and not realistic. We, 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 we did the same. We showed them the same. You know, we, we operated the same way. We just told them about it. We made it very accessible and very transparent. We didn't hide it in the small, small print. And this is completely counterintuitive for a U.S. customer. U.S. customer would see that I'm like, wait a minute, what, what do I need to sign up for here? This seems too, too scary. So they would drop off from that funnel. Well, in Germany, not only did we, they did not introduce friction in sign up, but we had a 10% incremental new sign ups, incremental lift in sign ups from this experience. And then I just, I don't want empty sign ups. I don't want people to just sign up and then never show up, right? I want them to do quality sign ups of people who actually uh, register and then take a core action. For a link, for a server monkey, the core action for conversion to paid is a deploy of the survey. More people respond to surveys, but I want we wanted deploy people to deploy a survey. And so I'm looking at the unique user ID of those people coming through this experiment and following them downstream in the funnel. So out of them, 25% deploy more, 25% more deployed uh, a first survey. And out of them, 24% actually converted to a paid subscription, right? Uh, annual subscription. So that was a huge revelation and that really also showed the executives that look, I mean, customers across the world, they're not, it's not just about language. We can render the interface in German, but that's not enough. We need to do some extra steps here. Another example is, um, you know, this is a thank you page. We call it the end page. So more people around the world actually respond to a survey than deploy their own survey, right? And we have um, much higher volumes of English surveys. And so more English uh, respondents. Um, so this was the, this is what we showed them as an end page, you know, just thank you for taking the survey. Yes, there is a sign up button. It's a very low intent attribution channel, right? If they sign up from here, they're probably not going to show up. They're, they're going to they're gonna be, you know, they're just going to be diluted. It's, a, it's basically a leaky bu bucket, right? So it's not, a, wasn't a very efficient uh, flow. While this is, this page is very low intent. People who, person who just responded to a survey does not have a high intent to deploy their own survey at this point. However, it has a very high visibility page, right? Very, very high visibility. And so I was trying to um, optimize that page for our uh, late adoption new markets, again, for top of funnel. So knowing that in Germany, again, people are less habituated um, to what Survey Monkey is about and the value proposition, uh, I, I experimented this version, which was the control, with, uh, with and this version we, we showed everywhere. It was a universal um, page with experimenting version one and version two with version two, you know, kind of more native look and feel um, for Europe, uh, providing some data points, you know. Um, V1, this one, uh, showing more, again, why should you join this ecosystem? What's, what's the value of server monkey? So giving them a little bit more data points um, it also has sort of a little dynamic interaction um, and a much cleaner, more minimalistic um, interface and uh, page layout. Um, this experiment here and the, both of them compared to control were just like off the roof numbers uh, success, right? I mean, this version had a lift in, of six, 600% in a new signups. But again, that new signups is, mean, is meaningless for me because unless they show up and unless they actually convert to pay down the road, it's meaningless for us, right? So uh, out of those 600% lift and new signups, 57% um, of them deployed a survey, which again, the second deploy is the cliff to conversion. Uh, here we also had very high numbers, but just uh, a little bit less than, than V1. In... Um, in England, so Germany is the late adoption new market, right? So I didn't have, we didn't have a lot of traffic there. So I had to run the experiments longer. And again, just focusing not on conversion, just focusing on them signing up and then taking a core action, which is deploying, deploying a survey. And that was a very successful optimization. In England, it's a mature market. 
Um, so I, I designed, you know, with my team, we designed this page, um, which we called it the direct to deploy. Again, it's the end page. They've just taken a survey. Instead of just saying, thank you for taking the survey, sign up. We actually have, um, we actually have, a you know, deploy a survey straight from that page. And because it's low intent, we're uh, highlighting the just for fun. And really the just for fun is kind of like a, you know, a poll, a quiz you can put on your social media. And at the time, you know, we made it, it's very local content. We, we tied the questions to local top of mind at the time, uh, what people in Britain sort of tying it to Britain, British humor and British uh, lifestyle, the Euro Cup at the time, um, the Brexit, uh, this is pre-Brexit, um, Wimbledon and so on. Um, that also had a uh, huge, huge success. Uh, on here, I'm want, I, I have high traffic, and so I, I could show the experiment for a shorter time. And I wanted to really optimize for deploy and conversion. And so we actually had a, um, what was it, 120% lift in deploy of the, of the survey. And again, each of these uh, categories, when they click it, if they go to healthcare, it doesn't take them to, it takes them to an N NHS, um, right? To a local content uh, and adapted content survey. If they go to a education, it takes them to a British higher ed template, right? So it's very local content. Um, so we had 120% lift in deploy. And out of that, 57% actually converted to pay. It was again, a very big um, achievement. And, um, before uh, moving to questions, uh, just one more quick uh, example of LinkedIn. At LinkedIn, we had the whole team dedicated to China. Um, again, looking at regional cultural factors, right? So it's a young demographic. So optimizing for the 60 to 26, uh, to 26 17 to 26 year olds, um, entry level internship first job. We create, it's a mobile first country, right? Uh, we created a standalone, lightweight mobile app uh, dedicated to the early job seeker. Right? As you can see, it's fully native uh, look and feel, uh, late native interface. Instead of the Twitter and Facebook, we have the Sina Weibo, Tencent QQ, um, social signals integrations. We did a WeChat integration in address book import when you onboard during the onboarding phase, which was a huge cliff to, to, um, to the brand growth. Uh, QR code way before QR code was, was, was common here in the US. Um, but one, one thing that we did that was sort of the cherry on the top was we also knew that uh, both government and Chinese consumers actually prioritized local brands. And so we didn't go in as LinkedIn. Many foreign companies, struggle coming in as their global with their global name into China because that is actually a disadvantage. So we sort of cannibalized our own brand and we didn't go in as LinkedIn, we went in as G2. Again, fully native um, app, native app. And um, that was, if you like, our Trojan horse into China. So LinkedIn is still um, very much, uh, very strong in China, very much, very much existing, whereas other social medias uh, could not survive there. Uh, with a lot of strategic partnerships with an alignment with the government, a lot of um, local efforts. Um, now it's not the app. Now we sort of we understood later on that company that customers there actually want to be connected to um, professionals worldwide, right? And so we had um, we established backend and mid tier that is tied to the flagship. Um, um, uh, service so that people can connect with um, with all the data points and with professionals around the world, but the front end is very native and uh, to, to resonate and to make it more uh, relevant for for usability in the country. And with that, um, I will end my my talk. Thank you very much, and um, ready to take on some questions.